else on the planet. Okay. Um, thank you very much for waiting. My apologies. I blame it on Austrian Airlines. Um, but thank you also for coming out on Wednesday to listen to a lecture in a foreign language. Um, I'm going to talk, as I think Armin, I hope he was saying, about my new book, Imaginary Futures, um, which is basically this message, the future is what it used to be. I'm going to, it's quite a long presentation, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go very quickly through the highlights of it. You can download the whole presentation, oh, somebody has just walked in front, excuse me. Lots of other stuff. There are videos and other things and articles. Okay, so as I said, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the future is what it used to be. Um, I know this sounds paradoxically, and but the reason why this is the case is because uh, this is a, a picture which my father took in 1964. Um, this is me, my sister, to my mother. Uh, this is 1964 World's Fair. Um, we're going, my father, I have to say, was a right wing member of the Labour Party. He's going on a CIA funded sabbatical to MIT in Boston, Massachusetts um, for the political science department. I'll talk more about these people later on. This is the World's Fair, this is the Unisphere, and there's a pagoda you'll notice in the back which also turns up later. The point about this I want to talk about this to start off with is because at this World's Fair when I was seven we were promised certain futures um, and the, basically America at this point was the most powerful per country on the planet. It had 50% of the world's um, industrial production, by far the strongest military, finance. It, Americans were two to three times richer than everyone else. And at the centre of the message of the World's Fair, apart from, you know, every nation of the world coming together, all the corporations and the states showing off, was this belief in new technology. There are, th and I, there are three real key technologies they were showing off. Um, on the left, actually this is the only thing I can remember from when I was seven, which was the space rockets. Um, and it was, they were saying that within uh, two decades you'd be going for holidays in the moon. So by 1990 at the latest, you could go for your two-week holiday in the moon. Uh, the middle is, is, a, is the first public display of a fusion reaction. General Electric, which made nuclear power stations, put on this and they said within 10 to 20 years, electricity would be so cheap to make, it would be free. No electricity built. The third thing is the IBM computer, uh, the System 360, which they actually launched in 1964, and they said there within 10 years you would have intelligent machines, artificial intelligence. Um, and in particular, at, uh, at the IBM Pavilion, this is Eno Sarin's fantastic design, you were lifted up, if you can see in the bottom, there's, there's like tiered seating, you were lifted up into a theatre where there was a multimedia display that told you that, that the computer worked like a human brain and the human brain worked like a computer. Um, and as I said, this would, the supremacy of America was that within, as I said, 20, 20, a generation, we'd have holidays on the moon, free energy and the thinking machines. Um, this use of the World's Fair to do this was not something new. Um, you know, way back in uh, the 1850s, uh, the British had put on the first, the Great Exhibition, uh, 1857 I think that is. Uh, this is you know, the world's first modernist building where they did the same thing. The Britain show, got nations will to show their own stuff, but the main thing was to show Britain's uh, technological superiority through the steam engine particularly, the machinery of the Industrial Revolution. And so one of the messages that comes out in these world's fairs right across the centuries for instance, these ones, this is the one from the 1939, uh, New, 1939 New York World's Fair, is the same thing, that new technology uh, represents geopolitical power. The future, in other words, by predicting the future, you can, you can understand this. What the imaginary future does is say, the present is basically an anticipation of the future, and by understanding the future, you can understand that's how you understand the present. Uh, it's a two-way process. 
So it's all so one of the key points about this, as I said, the book the book tries to do is to show the way that the future is not just simply predictions, that the future is actually a way of thinking about the present. So in Democracy City in 1939, they have this quite accurate prediction that within 20, 25 years, New York and the other American cities would be reorganized from being centralized industrial cities to being suburban cities. People would commute to work uh, in their own cars. And actually, in this prediction is quite interesting that if you went to the world's 1964 World's Fair, 25 years later, you probably did live in a suburb and you did commute. So this is what they predicted the future would look like by 1964, and this is what it did look like by 1964. <laughs> so in a way, as I said, it's as I said, showing that you have new technology, I said it's not just a way of saying we are better than every other nation, it's also a way of saying understand. So if you think in 1939, America is just coming out of the Great Depression, Europe is about to have another you know, civil war, East Asia is already in a war. America is saying we are the hope of the world because we are in a sense anticipation of the future to come. If you want to know what Europe and Asia will be, think of what America will be. Um, so, at the 19, so in 1964, you would have thought that these predictions of holidays on the moon, free energy, and thinking machines are quite credible. If this shift to be made in 25 years, why shouldn't they make the shift from uh, this 25 years later. Why in 1990 wouldn't you have precisely free energy holidays on the moon and thinking machines? Well, I think one of the interesting things is to think what these technologies were actually made for. Um, we, you know, if you think about the motor car, yes, it had military purposes, but its primary purpose was as a civilian transportation system. Um, computers at and rockets and nuclear power stations were invented for quite a different reason, which was to fight nuclear war, and particularly computers. IBM's career comes out of making machines to fight. This one on the left is IBM's first real electronic computer, called, wonderfully called the Defense Calculator. Um, I think there were about 16 or 17 of these made. Every one of them went to either US military or weapons manufacturers. This is the SAGE nuclear defense system, defense I use in inverted commas, I should take to say. It's a way that America would plan to fight a nuclear war. It's actually the first use of graphical user interfaces, computer networking, and a prototype of the mouse. Uh, so in a way what we can see here is that the computing, when, so when they're predicting, when they're talking about the thinking machine here, is a way of thinking about what actually is happening here, but in a different way. Because Nuclear, the fighting of nuclear war is, if you like, the latest iteration of what computing had been designed for. So in its first iteration, we can see, uh, this is Babbage's uh, difference engine, an attempt in the uh, late 19th century to create an analog um, calculator. And this is uh, Alan Turing, the people who worked in Bletchley Park, the, the, where they, they um, cracked the German Enigma code. And, and this is Baby, the, um, the Manchester University first computer. Now, these, it, all these efforts were funded by the state. This, is, this was funded by the Royal Navy. Obviously, this was fi funded so the British could win the Second World War win in inverted commas. Um, so we can think about the, the, what, that it was a military technology. And so the, the way you think about, about um, a computer in this sense is it's saying in two ways now. It's both as a, it has a use value as a, uh, as a, a military war fighting machine, but it also has this other thing. As I said, it's, it becomes an icon of the imaginary future. And particularly because the compute, what we have to think about is there were lots of technologies invented around this period. My mother always says, you know, if you think about what was the most influential technology invented in the 1950s, she said it was probably the contraceptive pill, because they were the first time that women could control their own fertility and weren't dependent on men. Um, but yet people picked up on the computer as a particularly iconic technology. And so one of the questions I ask in the book is why this is the case. Why should we do this? Well, partly I think this is because of the way that the computer became a way of thinking about the world. It becomes used, as I said, in this imaginary future. And in particular, in 1948, coming out of the researches of, the, basically the weapons researches of uh, the, in the Second World War in America, um, 
people started to try and create a meta theory that would, in the same way that different scientists were brought together from different disciplines to make weapons, they, they could create a meta theory that would connect not just all the natural sciences but also the social science. And particularly this character, Norbert Wiener, um, who was uh, um, uh, was actually invented uh, a, a self-correcting anti-aircraft gun um, and then went on to be like the chief theorist of a set of conferences which were held in the aftermath of the Second War and wrote this book. And this book is quite interesting because if you read it, it's sort of quite abstract, has lots of mathematical symbolism and uh, calculations in it, which is, yet it became a bestseller. And one of the reasons it became better because it seemed to explain this new high-tech world that was emerging in the aftermath of the Second World War and actually was the world that was coming out of this prediction, of this new world of Fordism, of consumerism, of the suburban home and all the rest of it, and the car and the motorway. But of course the problem with Wiener, if you know anything about him, is that it was that though he played a leading role in the Second World War, when it came to the Cold War, Wiener innate politics came out. In the Second World War, leftists could work with the US military. The problem is when the Cold War, people like Wiener started to say, well, actually, this, this far from this liberating humanity, uh, what we're doing here is preparing the grounds for a nuclear holocaust. And so Wiener, as a socialist and a pacifist, became, if you like, unacceptable. So they needed to find somebody else who could take cybernetics in a way that would be acceptable to the US elite. And, and for this person, they found somebody, Johnny von Neumann, who originates from Budapest, up, just up the road from here. Uh, uh, his family had been bankers uh, who had lost their, had their bank nationalized in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1919 in Hungary. Uh, eventually, via Germany, had ended up in America and was a die-hard anti-communist. Um, he worked on the nuclear bomb and in the late 40s, he advocated nuking the Russians to stop them acquiring a bomb. In fact, this would have wiped out most of Hungary in the process. doesn't seem to have concerned him very much. But he was responsible for, if you like, taking, taking cybernetics from being this meta-theory that, uh, that ex was a way of explaining, connecting both all the natural sciences and all the uh, social sciences together and to use the computer as a met metaphor for creating things like feedback and networks and all the rest of it into a much more narrow focus. N Neumann concentrated on one of Turing's predictions which was that the computer could become intelligent. Um, and so he, so cybernetics became replaced, if you like, with the study of artificial intelligence. So computers go from being this social analogy in a widest sense, which had a, in, in Norbert Wiener's um, interpretation, a socialist and pacifist implication, to being this much more narrowly focused on, on artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence, so, you know, you can say it's a good story because if you have people who are working on basically building command and control devices for fighting a nuclear war, that is wiping out Russian civilians in their millions and the unfortunate inhabitants of their colonies in Eastern Europe, uh, you can say to them, well actually you're not fighting nuclear war, what you're doing is building the intelligent machine. That the military is sort of inadvertently uh, creating a, the conditions to work towards this. And, he, and Neum, von Neumann and others said, well, you can, you can say the reason why we're going to have an intelligent machine within 10 or 20 years is because each switch in a computer is like the neurons on your brain. And if you have enough switches in your computer, they'll eventually reach the same size as a brain, and therefore the computer must think. Yeah? This seems a very dubious argument to me, but nonetheless, this is the argument that they... So you could actually mathematically, if you like, predict when intelligent machines would arrive. But as I said, I think it's much more to do with this concept of giving a mission to computer science. And of course it has a double meaning, because it's not just about... Um, the, 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 the focus is not just on com these command and control systems, but computers very rapidly, the military's fine, also are useful for other things, like uh, the playing war games to plan their campaigns, uh, for uh, controlling the inventory, controlling the supplies for their troops, and so on and so forth. So as a bureaucratic machine, the US Army and Air Force and Navy could use computers 
And so in a way, what happened is that as people, as companies like IBM are funded to create these machines for the military, they are actually also creating machines for their primary uh, customers up to then, which were in fact the business. IBM stands for International Business Machines, and it made its money out of tabulators. These are calculators which were used for stock taking primary and paying wages in what corporations. And so what, what, what's happening here is that, in a sense, IBM eventually would have been forced to go down the path of computing if only to, to keep up with the industrialization and the factory. As the, as the Fordist factories emerge in the course of the 20th century, manual workers on the production line are using more and more machinery, and the office starts to lag behind. I mean, the offices are using technology, telephones, typewriters, filing cabinets, and all the rest of it, and these tabulators. But the key technology that they see that they can up this investment is by introducing the computer. You can replace hordes of tabulator operators with a few people operating a computer. And so we know warned about this, the, the, the program of artificial intelligence as not just being about a cover story for military research, but also about a way of not thinking about the consequences of the computer in the office and the factory. And as he says here, is if you think of the machine as a mechanical slave, it means that you're saying that humans have to compete against a mechanical slave. And in a sense, what we know picked up on is that in our society, what we, you know, what is in economics called commodity fetishes, that is that we tend to think that the social relations between people are through things. And so it's interesting that he picks up on this idea that the machine, far from being our liberator, is a way that the domination of the factory is reproduced. The way that the relationship between management and workers is expressed through the fantasy of a machine that can run itself. That you could have, uh, you know, you could have factories without workers and managers. And in fact, what it means is you have people who have to compete against a mechanical slave. So this is one of the main imaginary futures I look at in the book uh, to prepare the ground in a way to say the pick try to explain why the computer is picked up as a key technology. As I assume I, I mean, was talking about in our introduction, we come out of this generation who in the 90s were very interested in the internet. And one of the reasons I got interested in this project was not just that I was having this prediction, thinking of this prediction back you know, when I was seven, I've been, been being told, but also that the way that ideas around the internet Actually, as I tried to discover where they came from, the sort of fantasies of the 1990s, the way that they act, I was trying to create an art, I understand where these came from. And one of the things I was interested in the 1964 World's Fair I picked up is the way that a lot of the things about uh, the way that the internet was supposed to unite humanity, you could see that the same rhetoric was used about the same technologies. Uh, this is the Telstar, this is what the first, uh, it's a television, it's a global, it's a, basically, it's a satellite that transmitted the first television programs across the Atlantic, went up a couple of years before the, um, the 1960 World for World's Fair, and if we go back here, there are three rings around the, um, the, the Unisphere in uh, Flushing Meadow, which is, this is the icon of the world's fair, one of which, it, two of which are uh, uh, commemorating space flights, but the third one is the Telstar, because it united uh, Europe and America through TV. The other, the other things, obviously, as I said, the 1960, you know, the, in 1964, that the IBM launched its system uh, 360, which was this, the mainframe, which is the mainstay of the um, computer industry for the next 20 or 30 years. And I am assured that my mobile phone is still using the same architecture as this computer and a video phone from Bell. And so what they were saying is that the, that the convergence on the one hand telecommunications, the other computing, and the third of media would create peace through understanding. So a lot of the rhetoric of the dot-com uh, era was in fact already present in 1964. When I was seven, I wasn't even aware that I was preparing for my theoretical career as a media, uh, as a critic of the internet. And this is because something else happened in 1964. This is a sort of, you know, as a sort of one of those iconic dates in recent human history, is that it was also the, the time when 
this book was launched. Um, in 1964, a Canadian English professor called Marshall McLuhan published his bestseller, Understanding uh, Media. And in this book, in a sense, he provided in a book form what these, this, this particular convergence was saying. It's not just that the computer will become intelligent, but that's his big, big creator synthetic individual, but that the computer, particularly when it converges with media and telecommunications, will create a new society. It will create what we now call the information society, or the knowledge economy, or the network society, all these various other uh, predictions that we also uh, uh, know so well. So in this, in this particular book, he, the key, one of the key phrases that's picked up and still used today is he says what is occurring is, a global uh, is the emergence of what he calls the global village. Nicely contradictory idea. On one hand, it covers the whole world. That is, the, the nation state will break down and be replaced by one world, but also it will be a return to the intimacy of the village. That we will, so in a sense, the, the problems of capitalism, alienation, nationalism, will be solved by the convergence of these three technologies into one. So in 1964, five years before the internet arrives, Marshall McLuhan is predicting that the internet will transform society. We will move from in the industrial era, what he calls the era of printing, basically, the Gutenberg galaxy, into a new epoch, the epoch of the internet, what he calls the global village. Now, in his writings, you can see uh, there are certain caveats. He was a Catholic convert, for instance. So you're never quite sure whether he believes that the global village actually is the new utopia or it's a sort of it's the antichrist preparing the way for the new for christ to return there's a sort of religious uh, sub theme in it but for us i think it's interesting is that, that was completely missed at the time this book became a bestseller because people took this book and because it's written in this very idiosyncratic style, what he, unlike most academics, he doesn't use footnotes, he doesn't have proper quotations. It's actually constructed by, he dictated this book to his secretary. Um, he didn't actually even write it. So it's written in this very easy to understand style, which is one of the reasons why it crossed over from the academic market into the mass market. And this prediction, and in the hands of people like uh, Tom Wolfe, obviously much more famous later for his novels, but for hip journalists like Tom Wolfe, they took McLuhan and turned it into McLuhanism. So in the same sense that we can say we have cybernetics without Wiener, what we get is this really weird emergence of, sort of McLuhanism without McLuhan, without the caveats, without the, 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 the sort of, because I said it's interesting if you read uh, McLuhan, he's a sort of jester as well, he's not just a sort of utopian prophet, but if you take this and turn it into a, 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 a gushing prediction of the optimism of how the internet is within the next 10 years, by the mid 70s at the latest, going to create this new society. Uh, people like Tom Wolfe and his PR agency, who were promoting him around, around America and then eventually the world and in television programs and in op-eds in the newspapers and magazines, he becomes this symbol of the 60s vision that there is an imminent technological liberation. So we have to say, why is this the case? And again, I think we need to go back, as with, with the prediction of artificial intelligence, and locate it in the particular time in which it's happening. I said, though this is a prediction of the future, a prediction that we're still, in a sense, living with, uh, it's an imaginary future that still haunts us, What's, it's actually based in a very particular moment. And I think one of the purposes of this book was to, by doing an archaeology of the future, a history of the future, is to then question these futures. Because McLuhanism, which is still a very dominant uh, theory across not just the media, but among politicians and economists and experts and, and, all the, and in, in the mass media and in academia and elsewhere, comes from a very particular moment in our history. And that is the history, is the Cold War. Like the prediction of artificial intelligence, it comes from when Europe was partitioned in two between the Americans and the Russians. And that the fact that, that this uh, partition was not 
a hot war. It was in the South, obviously, but in Europe it was not a hot war. Both sides had no intention of fighting a real war in Europe. But they needed to have an ideological struggle between the two sides to discipline both, both their own uh, spheres of influence. And so in this moment, uh, scientists and natural scientists and the social scientists played a key role. They're not just the manufacturers of weapons, they're also the inventors of ideologies. Uh, in, the, in the words of Joseph Nye, who's a foreign policy expert in America, there are two, what he says, says, says there's hard power and what he calls soft power. Hard power is military, economic, <coughs> and that, but also there's soft power, cultural power, uh, the power of believing that you control the future that you offer the best hope of society. So what they're try both sides are trying to do is say, but we want, we are made, both America and Russia saying we own the future. And by owning the future, it's a way of controlling space. And this is what creates the opening, not just for the Johnny von Neumanns and the, the, science, the natural scientists who are making the weaponry, but also for the social scientists who are making the ideologies, the, the weapons of soft power. And here, so up to then, you know, up to the 1930s, academics in America were, some, you know, they're not really part of the elite. They, they're off on one side. You know, the key people in America are obviously politicians and businessmen. And now you get the emergence of these key academics who become a, a, what, a part of what C. Wright Mills would call the power elite. Yeah? Uh, and that is because they are the people who are inventing the weapons, inventing the ideologies, running the university research uh, institutions, advising the government, and being the public face of the American empire. And within the social sciences, like in the natural scientists, there were key groups of people who had the knowledge which this elite needed. Now in the natural sciences, obviously, the people who knew how to make nuclear weapons, knew about nuclear physics, knew about you know, the new theories of cybernetics and computing, obviously had, became an important warrior scientist bureaucrat. In the social sciences, there was also a group of people who had a similar esoteric knowledge which was vital for creating soft power. And that was these, oops, oops, yeah, okay. And that was actually interesting, it was people who had a knowledge of Marxism. If you wanted to become, if, if America had this key problem in the Cold War, is that America was obviously richer than Russia, it was obviously more democratic than Russia, um, it, was of, it was more powerful militarily than Russia. It obviously had the dominant position within the split of partition of Europe. They got the rich half, the Russians got the poor half. But what it didn't have is a narrative of the future. It had a better present, but it didn't have a better future. In fact, it didn't have a future. All it could say to people is, you will become like America. It didn't have a, a prediction of what the future would be. And so these people could, had a key role to play. They could do two things. They could explain to people how America became powerful. They had a knowledge of what would be, we would call the materialist conception of history. But they also, crucially, had a way of taking the prediction of the future and turning it to the advantage of the Americans. As Ignacio Siloni, an Italian ex-Stalinist, said in this book, CIA-funded book, I should say, The God That Failed, the final struggle for government will be between the communists, that is the people serving of Russia, the communists of the capital C, and the ex-communists, the people who've now defected and are working for the American, like Siloni. And a particularly interesting person is to look at um, James Burnham. James Burnham in the 1930s was one of the three major leaders of American Trotskyism. He then, uh, he then became disillusioned and in 1940 wrote this key text, The Managerial Revolution. Um, and 
What he did is he took the ideas that Adam Smith had. Adam Smith saw it was the first person to realize that we had social evolution. Before we had natural evolution or geological evolution or the evolution of the universe, we first had to conceive that human society was evolving. And he said, Adam Smith says that we move through these stages from hunting to herding, agriculture to commerce. And of course, this, this influenced very strongly the, the American revolutionaries. But of course, in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century, this was taken over by the left, who said, well, why can't we go one stage further? When we're at the stage of commerce, that is capitalism, we should be able to go forward another stage, to socialism, to communism. And what Bernard did, having been a Trotskyist, he understood this. He had this specialist knowledge. As I said, these were the social scientists with the esoteric knowledge uh, to actually be able to create this argument for the American. And he, so he could take the materialist conception of history because he knew, and replace the next stage. So what he said is that human society had gone through an evolution from agricultural society into liberal capitalism, but now it's moving into a new stage, which is not socialism or communism, but what he called managerialism. There's a managerial revolution going on. So you could connect, this is the world of big business and big government, and you could say, what's happening in Russia? What happened in Nazi Germany? What happened in New Deal America? This book is written in 1940. Are all the same process. They're different types of the same process of the shift from liberal capitalism to managerialism. And this is then taken up by an MIT political scientist in the 1950s, and he wrote this book in 1960. This is a friend of my father's. This is where, why my father is going to MIT um, to study in the political science department. This guy headed a research institute at MIT. Uh, what, um, yes, what, Walt Rustow, named after Walt, so Whit, Walt Whitman, so you're off, you know, parents of Jewish socialist emigres. Uh, to America, had been involved in the American Communist Party, then in the, like lots of people had rallied to the cause in the Second World War, and in the 1950s becomes one of the major theorists of this Cold War left, and as he says, the stage of economic growth, a non-communist manifesto. It says it all in the subtitle. And what he says is we can replace the history, the, 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 the Marxist history, the history of the idea that we're going to move from, from, agri you know, through, from agriculture, feudalism, capitalism, communism, to a new one. He said, well, we, actually what you have is traditional society, which then goes through a takeoff, nicely mechanical metaphor. We then have industrial society, and then that's replaced by mass consumption society. And guess which country is mass consumption society? You can do a little graph like this, and it shows that by, a bit like Stalin actually, predicting that we get closer to communism by having more tractors and more concrete and more steel, that as you have economic growth, countries will go through these stages of growth. And so Europeans in the 1950s are basically in the industrial stage of growth. Most of the rest of the world is either a traditional society or going through takeoff. But the one country that's pioneering the future is America. It's the first country to mass consumption. It's in to this, as we saw here. It's this, uh, it's this basically. It's already here. Fordism is here in America. And so he's saying this is the future. So the future of Europe is America, not Russia. And they've proved it scientifically by rewriting historical materialism and showing this is the case. And as I said, it says it's a non-communist man. Of course, what this says is, though it appears as a social scientific prediction, of course, like artificial intelligence, it has very specific geopolitical aim. As I said, this guy is funded by the CIA. The political science department, which my father's going to go to, is every professor and every student is financed by the CIA, including my dad on his sabbatical. The whole department. So it actually has a very specific use. In the same way that you know the the the, the computer labs are funded by the U.S. Air Force. Exactly the same. They are making this is soft power rather than hard power. And the reason is, of course, because it it, it actually uh, creates the thing that the way well, if you say mass consumption society, it's a society like America. And this uh, vital center. This is Arthur Schlesinger. Uh, and he says, well, we've, we've now moved beyond the old 
the old paradigms. The old paradigms of industrialism, which is on the one hand laissez-faire liberalism, the chaos of the free market that led to the depression and the slump in the 1930s, and also its alternative, which is Russian totalitarianism, old-style Marxism. What we move towards is what they start to call the third way. Daniel Bell, another next Trotskyist turned member of the Cold War left, says, well, we're now moving, we've now got to a place where we, where basically it's about the wealth, it's about, you know, the mixed economy, uh, it's about cons political consensus, it's about managerial efficiency, it's the middle road between the two. Again, it all sounds incredibly familiar if you've if you're in recent political politics, uh, particularly coming from England, where of course Tony Blair famously called his politics the third way. That's why we used to say to people, "New Labour, it's my dad." Yeah. So the third way is is the is the politics of the, the of America of the 1950s, and of course what this again, I so said, what this says is for Europeans. If you have to choose between Russia and America, America is the future, not Russia. It's not Russia is a backward form of socialism and it will, will eventually overtake America. It's going to, event, it, as Rostow says, it will eventually converge with America. Russia will become like America, not America like Russia. And in particular, they use theorists uh, to explain this economically. And I think it's interesting to see that one of the key influences on them is an Austrian. Rudolf Hilferding, who wrote this book, it was published um, here in, I think, 1910 in Vienna, uh, called Finance, Finance Capital, uh, the full, uh, which then became one of the founding texts of what would become later known as Keynesian economics. Uh, J.L. Hobson, Michael Clazy. So what they wanted to do is say that there's a basic, you could, you, you could create a middle way in economics, which wouldn't be the free market, and it wouldn't be the totalitarian state it would be planned capitalism. Big business and big government to together would create prosperity. And this, and, and the proof, uh, we say in English, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. America was richer than everywhere else. My mother can remember that when we went to, up to America in 64, it was two to three times richer than England. It was the, com the country of large fridges and big cars and consumer prosperity and colour television sets and all the rest of it. And so, in this way, as I said, they had, in a sense, what they had now is they could say, well, what's happening by the early 60s is whatever faults are remaining in America, now things were changing, they were going to be finally sorted out. America would become obviously the great society, the best place, because people like Walt Rostow, this is him in the centre, are now actually national security advisors. They're the advisors to the president because Kennedy has just been elected. Uh, this is uh, Galbraith, who becomes ambassador to India. They even have technocrats like Robert McNamara, the head of the Ford Corporation, uh, as Minister of Defence. And so, obviously, the greatest problem facing America in the early 60s is that though it was the bastion of democracy, actually not, it wasn't a democracy, because large, millions of people couldn't vote because they happened to have the wrong colour skin. But by 1965, America became a democracy with the passing of the Civil Rights Act, and this is Johnson, Kennedy's successor, signing it into law. So even entrenched racism with this it would be richer, democratic, obviously the best, the great society, the best society in the world. But of course, as I said, comes back, but the problem, as I said, that it comes back to one thing, and the American president it's be obviously better than the Russian president. The difficulty is the Russians still own the future. And so this is the final problem that they have to solve. And in 1964, under Daniel Bell, they set up this thing called the Commission Towards the Year 2000, where they want to actually create an American future uh, so that they will have the American alternative to communism. Uh, so that you will say that not only America is better now, but in fact, in America will be a better. And you can see here, it's difficult to see here, but I'll just go you through this. This says pre industrial. This is the table, traditional, as in Rostow. That's industrial, that's massive. And here is what they call post industrial society. This is 1965. Uh, and you can see, surprise, surprise, who is first? This is the United States, it's just coming out of mass consumption. It's what, that's a surprise price, it's going to be the first, it's going to be the top one. Uh, the, um, 
the Russians are here and they're hopefully there's a big swing with it. There's probably going to be a massive assumption that if it's very lucky, you might be chasing the Russian coast. Um, this is in West Germany. And um, here we are, the British, you see, you see the British lagging behind as usual. So all Western Europe is following that. And of course, what it also shows is countries like China are going to go through the same stuff. So. so what it shows is America is the leader of the pack, and its enemies, its Cold War enemies, will be chasing it into the future. And of course, by owning the future, you can claim to control the present. As I say, it's a, it's a soft power claim. And there's a, so of course, the interesting thing is, is how, how, do you, how do you explain this post-industrial uh, society? Well, one of the things you do it, is explain it through this, which we show, I showed you here. It's, it's the convergence of telecommunications, the media, and the computer. But again, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that interests me right at the beginning when I started my research is why pick on these technologies? Why pick on media, telecommunications, and the computer? And I, and I think one of the things to understand this is it wasn't the Americans' choice. The reason they picked up on the convergence of these three technologies into the internet is because the Russians were already predicting this. Over in the East, in the 1950s, a group of people came together in Russia and used Wiener's cyber. I said to Wiener, as I said, to explain in America, Wiener was basically excluded from influence because he was a socialist pacifist. He then in the 50s is picked up by reformers in Russia precisely because he is a socialist pacifist who refuses to work on American military projects. And they take Wiener's ideas and use it as a way of criticizing Stalinist top-down central planning. And they say, well, what we can do is you take the technologies which we've used to create our nuclear war fighting command and control system and use it to run the economy, what they call the unified information network. This is the first concept of the internet in human history in the late mid late 50s oscar this is oscar lang he was a polish marxist economist a computer pioneer actually in poland who was also involved in this group of people um, and what they said is that if you put these together yeah these technologies together, you could create a cybernetic system so if you went down to your local shop and bought a pair of red socks it would send back to the red socks manufacturing factory, make more red socks and send them to that shop. Yeah? It's what we now do with barcodes. I mean, it's actually a remarkably accurate prediction of how our economy does work, actually. But it had another thing for them, is that it wasn't just a way of making central planning work. I mean, obviously, in a sense, we can say central planning in Russia was incredibly brutal and stupid, but it had won the Second World War and beaten Nazi Germany. But of course, by this point, especially in the 50s, the limitations here as an economic system were becoming apparent. But for these reformers, it was also a way of recovering the libertarian promise of the Russian Revolution, because they thought if you wired up the country, it wouldn't allow just people to communicate about their economic needs, but also to politically be able to run the country. And in particular, their, their, their this group of people saw that if you basically took the ideas of Marx, which obviously were very influential on the Austrian Social Democrats a long time ago, um, was this idea that the workers should run themselves. Also, in the Par Marx's analysis of Paris Poland, means called the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is, the workers should not only control politics through the democratic republic, universal, but also should use the same principles to control the economy. In the case of the cybernetic communists in Russia, it's the other way around. If you can control the economy, you can actually democratize totalitarianism. This is obviously the promise that Lenin made before the October Revolution in his famous pamphlet, State and Revolution, a promise that he did not keep. Yeah? But they also thought but their key thing, idea was that you could take that and combine it with cybernetics. That the computer network, the internet, was the way of recovering the hopes and nights. And particularly because this character you can just see at the bottom, next to the bust of Lenin, is Axel Berg. He was actually a minister of defense under Khrushchev. Um, he had a great journal which was called Cybernetics in the Service of Communism. Yeah? And he'd fought in the Russian Civil War, had been imprisoned by Stalin, uh, 
Stalin had let him out because he was an engineer during the Second World War, and he'd risen through the system, and he was one of, he was basically the patron of the reformers. And so he saw the net as a way, because as I said, he came out of the old Bolshevik generation of seeing this. And what and the, the, the summary of this really comes from the Prague Spring. Up, just up the road of here in Prague, uh, the Czechoslovak Academy of Arts and Sciences commissioned a group of intellectuals to work out how to move totalitarianism, the industrial system, into post-industrialism. They said, if, you, if, if the Eastern European system is going to evolve any further, it has to not only change the way we run the economy, based on the idea that unless America can come up with an alternative to cybernetic communism, it's screwed. So there's two parts of the program of the Bell Commission. The what first is to invent a, uh, an American future. Yeah? The other is to invent the internet. So there are two things going parallel with that. So on one hand, in 1964, the American Cybernetic Society has one of its earliest meetings, this is his book about it, where they say, where John F. Ford, a CIA-funded analyst, comes along and says there's a cybernetics gap. In the same way they would claim there was a bomber gap, the Amer Russians have more bombers than the Americans, or there, there was a missile gap, the Russians threatened to have more missiles. Than there's a cybernetics gap. Russia is threatening to overtake America. America's already been shocked in 1957 when the Russians invent, launched the first sat Sputnik satellite, then in 1961 when they sent the first person into space. Now the Russians are about to humiliate America again by inventing the internet. So one of the things you do is get JCR Lick leader, mate of Wieners, and give him huge sums of money to the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, which was set up to stop another Sputnik, and get him to invent the internet, which he does. Yeah? The other thing is to get the Bell Commission to invent an alter American alternative to cybernetic communism. And so the way you can do this, as I said, is, to, is how do you do this? How, how can you find this out? Well, one of the things is, to, is actually to go back to McLuhan, to look at McLuhan. And Mc, what is interesting about McLuhan is McLuhan is promising all the same things as cybernetic communism. You know, the end of the nation state, direct democracy, you know, online voting will be here within 10 years. Um, you know, it's the global village. And the, but what it's going to be coming through is not technology in the service, you know, cybernetics in the service of communism, that is it, through a social revolution. It will come through the technology itself, through technological. I won't go through this list. This is a, a hundred a list of a hundred inventions by the year 2000 which include wonderful things like using nuclear bombs for construction projects and putting people into hibernation. Interesting, artificial intelligence is not among them really, but it has some quite good ones like we'll have video recorders and so on and so forth. But as you go through this you'll notice, and specifically if you look at the ones I chose, is how many of them are about the convergence of media, telecommunications and computing, for instance. Uh, the basic business use of computers for the storage, processing, and retrieval of information. In, in inexpensive, high capacity, worldwide, regional, local, home, and business communication, perhaps using satellites, lasers, and the like. Fiber optics, we ask. Uh, inexpensive home video recording and play. One eye video, and so on and so forth. I will, I will, I said, we haven't had much time. Look at them, they're on the internet. Home computers to run household and communicate with the outside world, and so on and so forth. In other words, the internet. The, so, the, as I said, what, so in the sense, the reason why the internet is seen as a new stage of human civilization is because people were saying this in the 1964 In other words, before the internet was invented. Yeah? In a way, it was a, it was a social utopia before it became a functioning technology. Uh, because one of the questions I always ask myself is, you know, if you read the history books, they always say the internet was invented as a communications device that would survive a nuclear war. So you'd take cheap, and, uh, cheap reliable switches and replace them with expensive, flaky computers. Not a very likely story to me. But this seems to me much more credible. That The reason why the internet is being made is to, it's to stop it being another Sputnik, but also, more particularly, to claim the future. And so, this bell, I mean, they, they produced books, they produced, had seminars, but in, above all, what they did is they actually created the American future. And this is 
Daniel Bell's great book came out in the early 70s, where he takes historical materialism, as I said, the stages of economic growth, combines it with uh, McLuhan's technological determinism, you know, as an ex-Trotskyist, he knows how to do this. As a mate of Rostos, he knows how to do this. And as somebody, and what they do is they create McLuhanism without McLuhan. Now, as I said, McLuhan is a bit too flaky and, and too much of a jester. So they turn it into respectable social science, which proved that America is not only the most advanced country in the present, but it's also the future. If you own the future, you control the present. And this sparks uh, the, uh, inspires a discipline, futurology, where they start predicting, well, we're going to move from an industrial society to a post-industrial society, a society where the knowledge class will be dominant. Um, I've written this book called uh, The Class of the New, which analyzes the, how Bell picked up on a much older tradition within modern, modernist uh, thought, goes back to Adam Smith, again, that there's a small group of people who are predicting, who are, if you like, at the, the progenitors of the future, the precursors of the future in the present, and this institution, the university, the place where ideas and knowledge are created, is the model of the future. If you want, you know, if you're an academic and you want to know the future, just look out of your office window. Yeah? So this becomes, if you like, the basis of all predictions up to now. So when people are talking about the internet now, they're drawing on these ideas that came out of the Bell Commission and its response to cybernetic communism, where you take, so the information society, the knowledge economy, is American for cybernetic communism. So the question is, why is this interesting for us? Well, I think, again, what's... Again, you have to take it back. It's a prediction of the future, but it's rooted in the 1960s. As I said, it's the future is what it used to be. And in particular, it's this Cold War game that they were playing. They, they, you know, they, you know, actually, Lenin said that you know, the 20th century would be the century of wars, you know, incessant wars. But what's interesting is after the Yalta Agreement in 1944, there was very little violence in Europe between the two superpowers. Okay, they're brutal to their own populations, you know, like the Americans in Greece or the Russians in Hungary, but they, were the, they didn't fight wars between each other. And so it becomes, the, soft, the struggle for soft power becomes a key part of maintaining discipline within their two uh, spheres of influence. And of course, this is a Salzburg seminar, just at the road it, where I went as a child with my dad, Ace, and it's the Congress for Cultural Freedom. This was an organization set up by the Cold War left, ex-socialists and ex-Trotskyists ex, uh, in America, funded by the CIA to win the support of left-wing academics, politicians, to the American cause. And they would meet in Salzburg to, and this is a photograph taken by my father at one of these meetings. I haven't been able to identify these people. I'd be really interested to who they actually are. Uh, and so what they're doing, I said, it's the struggle for soft power here. So if you can say America is rich, is, is the future, it's what Europe will come. So the left, instead of looking to it, giving its loyalties to Russia or some variant of the Russian dream like Trotskyism, or it, it should look to America. America is the third way to the future. Uh, and of course, the interesting thing is that the, you know, the American dream, as I said, is not just a consumerist dream. Even the rebels are made in America. You know, the Elvis Presleys or the you know, Jackson Pollock or Miles Davis or the Beat Poets and all the rest. Again, Jackson Pollock, Congress for Cultural Freedom, third abstract expression. Jackson Pollock, an ex-Trotskyist, turned promote, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see that even the cultural rebels become American. But of course, I want to, What's interesting about this is that this is what attracts my father. My father taught American politics. You know, so he was spreading the word of the American Empire in Western Europe. Uh, as my mum said, they didn't have to pay him to go to, to admire America. He would have done it for nothing. Yeah? But he got rewarded by these sabbaticals. But as you notice, here we are at the World's Fair. And I just want you to look at this building in the back, because it's quite interesting, because it's a pagoda. And you would be forgiven for thinking, since it was the pagoda of the Republic of China, that it represented this very large country on the mainland of East, East Asia, where a fifth of the world's population is. Well, actually, it's not China. It's Taiwan pretending to be China. So this is the World's Fair, a sort of virtual version, American virtual version of the world. And so I think, because what we have to think about is that this, the partition of Europe also leads to the partition of the world. Because if you, as Americans, and you inherit the West, basically, you inherit all the old European empires. 
And so whereas in, in Europe, if you're comparing, say, living in Poland to living in France, it's obviously much better to live in France than live in Poland in this period. But out in the third world, the, the choice was not so obvious. Because when it came to the great game in the south between the two, if you lived in places like China or the other place in East Asia or Africa or Latin America, obviously um, what happened was that America was often, ironically, the people who were defending the old order. And you had a totalitarian police state, Russia, being the champion of freedom and democracy. Look at South Africa, look at most of Latin America, look at East Asia, or national independence. And again, like um, in Europe, they mobilised the MIT behind this. My dad's mate, uh, Walt Rosto, was the guru of what came modernisation theory, and you can use his theory, this, you know, what I was talking about earlier on, this Stages of Economic Growth book, as a way of explaining why even in the South, even if you're under pro, you know, rather authoritarian pro-American regimes, that you should follow the American road, because this these stages of growth are leading inevitably to welfare, to the welfare, you know, to the to the mass consumption society. You know, you'll go through takeoff and then industrialism and the mass, consumption, and eventually into the, the information society. So here we have, you know, and here we have this list of people. And I'll just show you this. Uh, so the British are first to take off. And then the next go. Then obviously, then the French, then the Americans, then the Germans, and so on and so forth. And of course, the Russians right down here is the enemy. And you can take everybody out of this. So everybody is following the same stages of growth. And of course, what this means is that in the South, this is sort of what happened in a way is that by, by having peace in Europe, they displaced the conflict in the South. So whereas, as I said, Lenin said that they, the, the imperial powers in, in the 20th century would fight over where the wealth of the world was, actually, they didn't do that. Because they didn't fight over wealthy Europe. What they did is they fought over impoverished nations in the South because it didn't make any difference. It didn't really make any difference whether you controlled some small furball country or not, but it allowed them to have the struggle. They could have it was a game in a way. And as and what's more, it could be theorized on a computer. You could use computers, cybernetic reasoning, to take this irrational struggle for imperial supremacy and make it look like a rational game. And the, 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 you know, the ultimate expression of this is, in fact, the American invasion of Vietnam. In night, because Vietnam had no geostrategical significance and no economic significance. But what it did do is have immense symbolic significance. Because what Vietnam did have was a revolutionary nationalist movement that saw not MIT and modernization theory as the, and the stages of growth, Walt Rosto's stages of growth as the past of the future, but following the example of Mao's China. And so what you have a struggle, so what the Americans were struggling for in Vietnam was not to possess a piece of territory as an old imperial power would have done to you know, seize its assets or exploit its people. What they were trying to do is control the piece of territory to prove that they own the future and the path to the future, to block off an alternative path to the future. And one of the major advocates of this invasion was in fact Walt Rostow. And Walt Rostow, and what, more over that, Walt Rostow worked out how the Americans could tell they were winning this war. Because of course one of the problems is if you go and fight a guerrilla war in a jungle, you, you know, again, you, can't, you can occupy territory, but you don't, know, you don't actually occupy it. The, the Vietnamese have beaten the French without seizing a single city or town. And for, so the problem was, how do you measure victory? And Walt Ross, of course, said, let's get a computer. And what we could do is map the, you know, the number of American and their, their collaborators, how many men of them die in each battle, as opposed to the number of Vietnamese who die in each battle. This is the body count. And if it's like a football score. If there are more goals scored by one side than the other, the Americans are obviously winning. And of course, this leads to this idea that technology will inevitably give the Americans victory. Because they have computers. They have better technology. And what Ross says, well, we now have mobility, thanks to helicopters. We have the computers that can plan the campaign. We have the bombing that will do, that will break the will of the Vietnamese to resist American occupation. And, and here we have my dad's mate with President Johnson. He was nationalist career. And they, here they have a little map of Vietnam and they're planning which village to napalm today. 
This is, and they were used. What's interesting? They were, again, this is we can see this is this is an early use of the internet. They they have a telecommunications network between the basement of the White House, where this picture is taken, and Vietnam. And they believe because they have all this knowledge coming in in their computers and through the, this convergence of media, telecommunications, and computing, that they they can control the battlefield from the White House. So they have a sort of virtual reality version of the war. And as he says, in 1965, he said the Viet Cong, that is their work, means Vietnamese communists, are co already coming apart and they will collapse in weeks, not months. 1965. And of course, as a key part of this struggle is the media war. Because there's no point beating the Vietnamese guerrillas unless everybody can see it. You can't say, well, we've beaten the alternative path of the future, the Russian-Chinese, paths of the future unless everyone sees it. So one of the key parts of the Vietnam is obviously sending what we now call embedded reporters, sending out TV crews with the troops as they go around chasing guerrillas around the countryside and all the rest of it. Yeah? But of course the trouble with this vision is it failed. That in fact the, when it was a choice between the Maoist road to modernity and the MIT modernisation theory, the Vietnamese chose Mao, not Rostow. Yeah. And in particular, as I say, what's interesting is, is in, you know, in 1968, in the Tet Offensive, that if you, you can read, still read books that say the Americans won the Vietnam War militarily. But of course, what happened was that, that the, the, they, won, they lost it politically. Because first, the, you know, the, popul the population of America lost support for the war and the troops on the ground stopped, started refusing to fight. So they might not have been beaten on the battlefield, but they were beaten politically. Not only among the Vietnamese, but also in America. And so we have, so you know, as the you know the last scene in the final episode of the long-running TV series is the liberation of Saigon in 30th of April 1975, and this is the iconic image where the Vietnamese tank goes into the presidential palace of the puppet government the Americans had set up in the south. And what's interesting about this, it's a fake. Because what had happened is the Vietnamese actually liberated the palace before the TV crews arrived. So what they did is they took all the troops out, put the gate back up again, and this is why the, you always see the TV crews all nicely positioned for the Vietnamese to come and liberate it, because they set it up so it would be on the TV news. So, as I said, this is interesting, that, as I said, that this symbolic struggle for soft power is about a struggle about the future. And it's a future based upon whether or not America owns the imaginary future which allows it to control the present. So you have a war where three million people die, which is about who controls the future. And one of the, one of the key ways we can see how this, um, this cybernetic communist future, how it's subverted by the Vietnam War, is the way that how McLuhan's prediction, McLuhanism, becomes bizarrely fused actually with the very thing it was competing against. As I said, the, the Bell's Information Society is a counter to cybernetic communism. And yet by the early 70s, when uh, Bell's uh, you know, coming a post-industrial society coming out, one of the major interpretations of uh, McLuhanism is actually a sort of bizarre Maoist Marxist vision. In fact, it's actually in a sense double reflected back on itself. And so you get in the hippie thing, I mean, there's this great uh, Michael Shannon later became a very famous Hollywood TV producer, was then community TV activist. Yeah? And as he said, it grows out of a computer printout, not the barrel of a gun. He's uh, remixing Mao Zedong's famous phrase. And so you get this, and, and in the Europe, of course, you get the situationists and the people who are influenced by them, who also say, well, what we, the way we're going to get rid of Ford is capitalism, move beyond this, is by creating cybernetic communism. And so McLuhanism, from being the counter to cybernetic communism, becomes a sort of new left version. And it, you, know, you can see this right up to today if you read Tony Negri or the fans of Deleuze Guattari. I mean, it's really interesting the way that they're still obsessed with this sort of strange mixture between McLuhan and the cybernetic communists. But of course, what's also interesting is the way that it was taken up. McLuhanism did. Because, in a way, the defeat in Vietnam discredited the Cold War left version, the third way version, this idea of the technocratic state, it not only created this left wing version, this reverse, if you like, a version, a mix that drew on cybernetic communism, but also it created the neoliberal version. And so you can see, actually, the way, again, 
I just, when I was coming here, I saw this great poster for the Financial Times which had Richard Branson's face morphed onto Che Guevara's. Yeah? So again, you have this double, ref another, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Where, again, you have the, the McLuhanite, McLuhanist revolutionary is not the man with the gun the, or, or the community uh, media activist or tactical media activist, it's, the, it's Steve Jobs or it's the dot-com entrepreneur. And of course, the, you know, the, the, the inter again, and, and I, I know uh, Armin talked about this earlier on in the introduction, is a way that, you know, you get, you got in the 90s, mid-90s onwards, the way that uh, magazines like Wired would take things like, this is uh, a Norman Rockwell, but Norman Rockwell, I should say, was an American Stalinist who then became a very popular patriotic painter in the 1950s, but socialist realism for Americans, this is. Uh, uh, and so this is a picture, again, of, you know, of the way that the dot-com boom is McLuhanism. It says, America is pioneering the internet, therefore America must be the future for the rest of the world. You know, the claim on the, on, on the present is that control of the imaginary future, because the present is just the beta version of the future. And by understanding the future, we understand what's happening in the present. And with each new piece of hardware, or each new software release, we're going closer and closer to that future. So it doesn't matter that America has, you know, crazy gun laws and no welfare state and all the rest of it, and there's a huge gap between rich and poor and terrible infant mortality rates, it's got the internet. It's got more internet than anywhere else, so it must be the future. Um, um, again, as I said, it's interesting, as I said, so that's one, you know, there are these multiple, so McLuhanism, interestingly, though the people who invented McLuhanism in its dominant version, its third wave version, were discredited by the fact that they were the, the chief boosters of the invasion of Vietnam, they also spawned all these different heresy, heretical versions. Um, and so you do get these radical versions still going in the net itself. And so one of the questions is, again, when you say, well, why is the internet dominated by the gift economy? Yeah? It's partly because when Lip Leader built the internet, it was built as the American imitation of cybernetic communism. He, he, he didn't see it as a purely commercial enterprise. He didn't see it as a top-down military project. He actually saw the, the way that academics operate was, as Axel Berg and Oscar Lang were saying in, in Russia, a sort of prototype of a post-capitalist society. So it's this interesting way that here Tim Berners-Lee, the English academic who helped Venter, actually says that some of the key parts of any information capitalism, the buying and selling of information, is not possible in the information society. So why are we thinking about this, just to conclude? Well, one of the reasons is, and I think it comes back to this and why I touched on the Vietnam War, is because unless we adopt a critical attitude to these futures, unless we know the history of these futures, we could end up repeating them. And it seems to me this is a very classic example of what's happened recently. I mean, um, uh, you know, Donald Rumsfeld said that the reason why they were invading Viet, uh, Vietnam, that's it, Freud is, Iraq, was to show who was boss, basically. It was literally a demonstration of force in the same way as the invasion of Vietnam was. Uh, you have Rostow and Wolfowitz. And obviously the other thing is the way that politicians like Tony Blair followed George W. Bush, despite his reactionary, political, economic, ecological and moral positions, because America is the future. Uh, I'm a member of the Labour Party, so I've, I've, I have argued with Blair, and they said, but America is the future. They actually do say this to you. America is the country that we have to copy things from. All right, we'll alter them a bit and make them a bit more humane. We'll follow the third way, as in the 1950s and 60s, but nonetheless, we should follow them. So this is one reason, I think. The other thing, as I said, I think is that we, it is by understanding the, the McLuhanist problem, the problem with McLuhanism, is like artificial intelligence, McLuhanism says it's not people who make history, it's the machine that makes history. It's not that we, in the same way artificial intelligence says we'll replace fallible human beings with this immortal machine, this robot slave. The, the McLuhanists say we will replace our society with, or it's the machine that will remake our society. 
And of course, one of the interesting things is the way that the internet has actually allowed the subversion of this McLuhanist dream. I mean, if you think of the protest movements against the invasion of Iraq, had a, what a key role, this is just some photos I took of the demos in London at the time, um, the way it played such a key role in um, organising the demonstrations and protests, you know, blogs and websites and uh, list service and all the rest of it. So again, you can see that and this is people. This is people taking control of the technology, a technology designed for business or designed for an imperial product, and using it against it. And of course, this leads to the, of course, always my, my favourite irony is the way that at the moment we have, do have these two visions competing against you, but they're social projects. Yeah, so on the one hand, you have people in the gift economy constructing actually within the internet what uh, a friend of ours in America calls software communism. Of course, he says the hard bit is hardware communism. He's a Wall Street analyst, so he says software communism, that's easy. It's hardware communism, that's the problem. Uh, so these gift economies, and of course the way that then the multinational corporations are then having to follow the free, as Kevin Kelly would say, to stay in the game. So as a final message, in this long presentation, is I want to say, in a way, that the information society predicted by the cybernetic communists and by the Bell Commission the inf is, is here, in a way. You know, and lots of us have broadband connections, Wi-Fi, mobile phones, the convergence has happened. But on the other hand, it's not changed from industrial to post-industrial society. It's not fundamentally created this you know, the, the utopia of the global village or cybernetic communism. It had, you know, we're still divided into nation states. Capitalism is still the dominant mode of production. Um, so in a way, what we have to do is invent new futures. We must live, you know, by understanding the history of this future, why computers in particular, and computer networks were seen as a dominant I, symbolic technology of modernity in the last 50 years, we can liberate ourselves to then think of new futures, futures which maybe are more socialist, ecological, feminist, convivial, and liberatory. Thank you. And, and thank you for putting up with my English. As being English, I always speak English very badly, too quickly. <laughs> I think it was all started later and it's about leaving, but I think if somebody has some question, can we ask you questions? Yeah. Do you want to? Stun them into silence. I told you. So you're going to go off and invent new futures now.